Michael M. Middleton here, still sheltering from the rain at Wonderwood Park in Lacey. Uh, going to be doing my last video for the day, sharing from The Great Deep, my allegorical fiction novel. And I will let you pause and get a little bit of an overview of the book from the back if it's the first one in the series you've run across. Uh, follow the link to my playlist of good books on my YouTube channel to see the rest of these. If you're interested, if this is, happens to be the first video you're running across, uh, all sales of all of my books, which I believe there's 20 at the time of this video, uh, is are available at amazon.com forward slash author, A-U-T-H-O-R, forward slash M-M-M, and 100% of all proceeds benefit uh, Youth with a Mission Faith Harvest Helpers. So I like to say, uh, get a good read and do a good deed. So I'm going to read uh, chapter 11 now, which, again, if you see me pausing strangely, uh, take note of uh, what I mentioned at the beginning of chapter 9. Uh, I'm going to begin with one of the relevant poems that kind of addresses the theme here. I wrote several years before from my book, Sacred Journeys, uh, which I published in 2002, this is called Two Men. Two men living in one skin, battling for control. One must die, the other shall fly to the champion of his soul. To realms of light and star-blazed flight to dance before the throne. Precious gems we are to him who kneel to him alone. But first the flame, first the fight. First the pain and first the night. First the race and then the prize. First the dust and then the skies. Until that day we yet remain, battling the darkness and overcoming the pain. Two men, living in one skin, battling for control. That's very much the theme of this book and particularly of uh, these few chapters, 9 through 11. So I'll now read uh, chapter 11. Vaguely, William realized that he must be dreaming again. Having been knocked unconscious, his mind was somewhat blurred. But he gradually became aware once again of that bizarre sense of being awake inside of a dream. In some minute measure, he was aware of the events of the day which had brought him to this point. However, his mind was currently focused on the reality he now found himself immersed in. At first, he simply felt. He had no sense of vision or sound, nor any sense of these being absent. He did not feel as if he were blind or deaf, but the only sense he noticed at first was a sensation, a feeling of floating, of being suspended, of being in between. He also experienced a strange sensation of decompression. He felt as if he were expanding. It was as if he, his very being, had, become, had been compressed inside of a vessel of some sort and was now being released. As his essence escaped its earthly shackles, William felt himself being drawn upwards. He had no idea how he knew that this was up, but that's what it felt like. This was by no effort of his own, but through some immutable natural law. As a cork released from one's grasp at the bottom of a swimming pool needs exercise no effort in order to rise to the surface, so he having been released from that which bound him to the dust, simply rose. In an instant of graceful repose, William suddenly felt himself coming to rest. He had arrived somewhere. In a carefully synchronized flood of revelation, he gradually became aware of the sensation of vision. Initially, it was simply as if he had been encompassed by a thick fog, intermingled with its substance. As his being congealed, he became aware of being surrounded by the mist, but no longer a part of it. 
All was a hazy, brilliant white. How big was this place William now found himself? He did not know. He had no sense of big or small, but only of limitlessness. Before long, the haze began to clear a bit. In front of him, William now saw something truly awesome in the distance. From out of the mist, there suddenly appeared a great hall of white stone veined with silver. Grand columns rose skyward to his left and right, and at the far end lay an enormous slab of white stone. An altar he somehow knew. This altar rose from a seven-layered foundation, forming a staircase which surrounded it on all sides. Although there was a truly awesome radiance encompassing everything in all directions, what William saw in the very center of this display put even that to shame. Rising from the very center of the altar was a brilliance that could not be believed if it were not seen. A pillar of pure, liquid, living light erupted with a glory beyond comprehension. This fluid radiance, brilliant, this fluid radiant brilliance surged and pulsated with an inexhaustible, self-sustaining potency that truly made William feel small. Despite the veracity of the power before him, William was not afraid of it, or at least part of him was not. He was suddenly overcome once again by that otherworldly sense of duplicity, of being in two places at once, of being two people at once. He felt a sudden sense of weight in his arms. Glancing down, he found himself to be carrying himself, or rather a copy of himself, like an identical twin. However, there was something, well, different about this twin. Radiating from this other self, William could see and feel darkness. This other self seemed to be a repository of sorts. Sharply etched on its face was everything negative within William. All the fear, anger, and bitterness. All selfishness and pain and greed and envy. Within this other, there seemed to reside all of William which was dark, everything which was not pure. This creature embodied everything that was unlike the brilliance before him. Instinctively, William knew the task that was being asked of him. The impurity, the filth, the self which he carried. All things of the lower nature must be sacrificed upon that altar. All impure motivations, all fear, all greed, all envy, all that was of darkness must be exposed to that light, there to be consumed. There was no one forcing him to this task. No booming voice from the sky or spear to his back. There was no act of bribery or coercion coaxing him to do what he knew he must. He simply knew that he must, of his own free will, choose. And yet, how can one of his own free will choose to be put to death? William's identity was so intertwined with that which he was being asked to sacrifice that he could not understand how he could sever himself from it. Though he did not understand how, he knew that in order to live, he must allow a certain portion of his being to die. The struggle he now undertook threatened to strip William of his sanity. He felt himself, his consciousness, his will, torn wildly back and forth between his two natures. Just as he believed that he had summoned sufficient courage to approach the altar with his despicable cargo, that lower nature would launch into a vicious assault. Fear, anger, and self-justification would attack in dynamic waves. Following a monumental struggle, light and truth finally won the battle. 
but only by the narrowest of margins. With conviction burning through every fiber of his being, William fought his way to the gleaming altar of stone. At the very moment he set his lower nature upon that altar, the nature of the fiery pillar of light somehow changed. The blazing, pure white radiance remained totally undiminished. But now there was something more. It was as if what he had sacrificed had functioned as a prism of sorts. Swimming within the pillar of white radiance, there now appeared blazing orbs of color, spheres of molten emerald and ruby, topaz and sapphire, citrine and beryl, rose from the dissolving form before him and majestically spiraled upwards as a fit offering. William had won a mighty victory, but he somehow knew that it was only a beginning. There would be many more battles. There would be many more struggles in this sacrifice of self. And yet, this was a beginning. Bathed in this knowledge, the scene before William began to fade. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Matthew 16, verses 24 and 25.